Bwana asifiwe. You are well in the Lord, bracing the cold weather, but warm inside. Uh, we really want to thank the Lord. Um, today we will be getting our encouragement from Jude. We'll be getting our encouragement from Jude. Jude is uh, towards the end of the New Testament, and we pray that the Lord will help us to just understand a little bit about the topic kept in God's love. Kept in God's love. Um, and, and, you know, that is a, a beautiful, just a beautiful thing to remember tonight, that we are kept in the love of God. So Jude is only 25 verses, so please allow me to read the word of the Lord to us. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy and peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in amongst you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep the position of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chain for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffered the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people populate their own bodies, reject authorities, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instincts, as irrational animals do will destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's era. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruits, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, forming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been forever reserved for them. Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesies about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words and godly sinners have spoken against them. These people are grumblers and false fighters. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They say to you, in the last time there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. I wish you can underline verse 20, if that is indeed your Bible. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus, 
will bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by the corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. And we say, Amen. Amen. Wow. I love reading the word of God. Now, this is Jude. Um, for those who know, Jude is uh, he's identifying himself in this text as the brother of James. But it's also important to know that this is Jude, also the brother of Jesus. You know, the other name, Jude is a short one for Judas. So, um, for, for reasons I want to preempt, he doesn't want to call himself Judas, because there was also another character called Judas. And sometimes it's good not to identify so much with such. But he's Jude, the brother of Jesus. I know, maybe, maybe you know that the Bible records that Jesus had brothers and sisters. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 15 to 56, uh, 55 to 56, in verse 55, of Matthew chapter 15, G, uh, the Bible records the names of the brothers of Jesus. And the names of the brothers of Jesus were James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, of whom now we are reading his writing, he are known as Jude. And also in verse 56, the Bible talks of, and he had other sisters, in plural, but the names are not mentioned. So one, we know that Jesus had uh, brothers and sisters. The other thing that I think is important for us to note at this point, even as we discuss the book of Jude, because it's just a small book, so today, this evening is like we are doing a Bible study of Jude. But the other important thing to note is that the brothers of Jesus and the sisters of Jesus and even the entire family of Jesus did not at first recognize him as Messiah. They did not recognize him as Messiah at the first glance. If you look at uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, the Bible says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. And listen to what they said. He is out of his mind. They did not even understand him, they said, is out of his mind. In fact, they went to protect him just in case he speaks anything funny. He, they went to provide some, some security for him. In John chapter 7, verse 5, his brothers, for even his own brothers, did not believe him. The Bible says so, that even his own brothers did not believe. So they did not believe in him. However, after conversion and believing in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, we see a turning point of their lives. We see his brother James. And you know, when you look at the writing of James, amazing writing packed with a lot of acts on how to become good people. But not only that, do we even see James. But you know, James was a very critical figure in the church in Jerusalem. At some point, he was actually being consulted over very critical theological issues of that time. And the other brother that we are now reading his work today is Jude. And listen to this. The way Jude begins this, he starts by saying, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. You know, I, I know that that is not the area of interest that I have this evening, but I just wanted to push to you, if you are the brother of Jesus and you want to introduce yourself. In fact, you will even forget your name, it will come later. You will start your name like, um, Buana Sifiwe, I'm a brother of Jesus and my name is Luke. But listen to Jude, he's saying, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I think Jude 
had understood something beyond familyhood to something about spiritual connection. You know, he only identifies himself with James, and of course there is also maybe a reason for that, because Jesus was technically like the last born, uh, so James was the elder, so they wanted to identify with James as well. But that is not important. Jude wants to write to his people. And then we see a text in the Bible whereby we are even given the intention of what he wants to write. We are given the intention of what he wants to write. Look at verse 1. He's saying, dear friends, although, although I was very eager to write to you about salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. You know, the Bible is even telling us the, the intention that Jude had that was not included here. The Bible says that he intended to write to us, he intended to write to his hearers or listeners and readers about the joy of salvation. Maybe he wanted to write to them about, oh my goodness, since you got born again, since, you know, he wanted to tell them, you know, I was the brother of Jesus, but there is a special experience that I had when I started appreciating not Jesus, my half-brother, but Jesus, the Messiah. I had this beautiful experience. Maybe he wanted to write about that, about the salvation that they share. But something cropped into the mind of Jude that he could not continue with his intentional subject of writing about the salvation that we share. And this is what he says, I felt compelled, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted for us. In fact, the, the, there is a very, very long Greek word that has been translated contend, and it is the word for which the English word agonize comes from, so what, in essence, is being said here is that I've been compelled to urge you to agonize for your faith, to contend for your faith, to somehow protect your faith, to make a stand about your faith. And then the question that will be asked by the readers, what is this? that is so serious for Jude that instead of writing for us about the joy of salvation, he opt to write to us to agonize, to contend, to stand for our faith. What was this? And then he introduced the topic of some false teachers have crept in into the church. Friends, you know this, this, this passage here, may not sound as heavy as it was then. Because in our generation, the things which we consider dangerous for the church are not majorly doctrinal. The things that provoke us to have meetings, disciplinary meetings, Nathan, are when you don't come to choir three times. But the issues of doctrine, the issues of truth, the issues of the right doctrine were so heavy that Jude could not help. He had to edit his writing to write about the doctrine because there are some people who had cropped into the church. He's saying so for certain individuals whose condemnations have been written long time ago have secretly slipped in amongst you. They have secretly slipped in amongst you. And they are doing several things. He actually identifies them. He identifies several things that these people are doing. Look at verse 4. He calls these people ungodly people. He calls them ungodly people. He says, for certain men, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into license for immorality and deny Jesus our only sovereign 
and Lord. And I think Pastor Emmanuel alluded to this last week for those who are not here, that we can go either to the extreme of, you know, saying the grace is sufficient, so you just live carelessly. So there are these people who had crept into the church, and they will not teach sin. They will only teach about you are okay. You are okay. All is well. We don't want to hurt you. Where should we? We don't want things which will hurt you. You are okay. These people had come, but look at their, his description. They are ungodly people. They are ungodly people. They change the grace of our God into license for immorality. But the most dangerous thing is that they deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign and Lord. They were teaching that there are some other ways by which people can stand. There are other ways by which you can be righteous. There are other ways by which you can be okay. You can be okay when you come. When you walk well, you don't walk heavy, heavy. You are okay. You know, when I was a youth leader, uh, I think I was a youth leader sometimes back. I've, you know, personally, I've been a youth leader in local church for those members who are AIC Damu, local, you know, the local church. And then I was a youth leader in the branch. Please, if you don't know it, forget about it. And then there is a DCC. I was a youth chairman. And then I was a youth chairman of the region. And also the youth chairman of the newly then area. So when I was a youth leader, just at the initial stages of my salvation, and you know, I've been, I was not taught so much. There is a day that I stood by the, at the gate of the church and I will see anyone who comes with uncombed hair or some funny ways and I will tell them you need to go back and come changed. <sighs> some of these guys that I was with last time, the other time they came here and they asked me, Pasi, you remember those days what you, were, you used to do for us? And I said, you are right. What I used to do for you, because I did not understand this, I used to do for you. Then I was a youth leader. I was learning. No one had discipled me. I was just elected as a youth leader, and I did not know so much about God. And the, the kind of weight that I was putting in people, you remember those times when white cloth was the thing? You remember those times when white cloth was the thing? And you could not come without a white cloth on a particular day. I shared also maybe another story. I'm telling you about things which look so spiritual, but they are not. Another story of a church where a new pastor came, and you know, the new pastor was wondering, kwa nini watu wakingia kwa ikanesa wanainama? Wakifika kwa mlango wanainama, hivi na wanaingia. So one day they opted to go and ask the old lady in church, who has been in church for a long time, but now she's not coming because of age. So they went and asked her, why, why, why is it that in this church people, when they come, they bend at the door? And then the old lady asked, are you people still bending? She says, yes, we are bending. He says, you know, we used to bend because the door was lower. The door was a bit lower, so we, we used to bend so that we can fit in. But you know what has happened? That has been changed into some kind of spirituality and what makes you fit into the church. Judy is saying, watch out for these people. Watch out for these people. Verse 8 talks of them as dreamers. They are not only ungodly, but they are also dreamers. You know dreamers? Dreams. They dream dreams which never are dreamt. Verse 12 calls them blemish. Verse 12 again calls them waterless clouds. Well, in fact, it calls them waterless clouds and also fruitless 
trees. These are the people who have come. And by the way, they are not as aggressive as we think. Mm -mm. They are not as aggressive as we think. When they appear in your television, they, they are not siwa chokozi. Siwa chokozi. They are good people. They come with a lot of dreams, with a lot of blemish, waterless clouds. It is still cloud in as much as it cannot bring water. Fruitless trees. In fact, it says fruitless trees in atom. Atom trees without fruits. Like fruits which look beautiful, nice, good. But they can't produce. Uh, the trees which look good, nice, but they can't produce fruits. They have cropped in. Imagine these are the things that made Jude not to write about the joy of salvation because he knew how dangerous this can be. Verse 13 calls them raging waves. And verse 13 once again calls them wandering stars. They are wandering stars here and there and there and there. And then the most painful aspect there is to them, darkness has been preserved. You know, there is an argument whether in heaven, in, in hell, there will be darkness or light. And I was telling a friend of mine, in as much as there will be flame of fire, you will not even feel the lightening of that fire because your heart will be so dark with eternal damnation that you have. You cannot even feel the lightness. In fact, the Bible in Matthew chapter 8, verse 12 says, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You will not even have the eyes to see the light. It will be darkness. That is the destiny of these people. And that is why Jude had to write about them. People who pervert the grace of God into license for sin. Waterless clouds. Fruitless trees, wandering stars, dreamers, blemish. People who have cropped in into the body of Christ. And then Jude gives three examples of a warning for us and even for his listeners. He gives three examples. The first one, he gives an example of the angels, of the Israelites. He gives an example of the Israelites that, you know, they grumbled and they grumbled and all the time they did not obey what God was saying. They gave in into the character like of these people and God destroyed them. You know, they were grumbling. What about this? What about this? And God says, okay, I, I think some of you need to remain here so that you... You know, just, just, just remain here because I think you're so tired of life. He also gave an example of angels who did not obey. Angels who bought into the things which are not of God. And then finally, he gave example of the people living in and around Sodoma and Gomorrah. He destroyed them. Friends, I'm not going to list how dangerous these people who have slipped in into the body of Christ, into the church, into our televisions, into they have become the big names. I, I, don't, I don't want to list the danger that they bring, but let me just say this. Their danger, the danger that they bring may not be too loud. The point when the gospel is diverted, it may not be too loud. It is diverted slowly. But at the end of it, it will leave people without the truth that takes them to life. It may not be hurting. It is not painful. After all, as a mshiriki, it is not painful for you. You will come and go home. It is not painful when you watch them and you, you know, interact with them. It is not painful. But when the doctrines are compromised and when the truth is shed off and personality takes place, it robs people of the truth. And it is that truth that sets people free. 
And when you are not free, you live in assumption and you join them in their dream. But listen to this encouragement as he finishes from verse 17. He says, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts. They do not have the spirit. But listen to this. But you... But us, AIC Milimani, but us who have come here, but us who have known the Lord, but you, dear friends, do these three things. And are the three things I want to encourage you. And I want to encourage myself to do if we have to survive being kept of God in his love. One, build yourself in faith. Amen. Build yourself in faith. Friends, let me tell you, more than any other thing, if there is anything you can do to yourself that you will not regret, is we continually build ourselves in faith. One of the things that I desire and pray is that God will help me every single day to be asking myself the question, how much have I built myself in faith today? Because if we don't build ourselves in faith, then the lies of these people who have crept in will take us over. We will, we will go like Sodom and Gomorrah. We will go like the angels who did not disobey. We will be like the Israelites every single time. Build yourself in faith. The question is, how do I build myself in faith? Find relevant fellowships. Read the word of God. Challenge your thoughts. Put yourself into the way of the standards that Christ gives us. Let us live building ourselves in faith. Number two, what is he saying? Not only building ourselves in faith, but he's saying also praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Pray in the Holy Spirit. Don't just pray because people are praying. I was a prayer coordinator when I was at AAC Shabab. And, and sometimes I've mentioned this to our youths. So I was, I, was, I was organizing for prayers and people will come for prayers. And one day, everybody came for prayers. And you know, when you, 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 you come to church and you find your corner, and so I had my corner near to the pulpit, of course, I'm a pastor. But I, I don't know what, I had a heavy heart, and I started praying, and have you ever come to that point, you feel like you're praying and it is not going anywhere? It comes back to you and your head. It is at that point that you look at everybody still praying 30, 40 minutes, and you're wondering, where did they get the content? You, you're done with your content. Friends, the Bible says, if we have to conquer, let us pray in the Spirit. It doesn't have to do with you. It is not about you. It is not about the words and the content. It is about, it's not about how long it is. It is not about how short it is. It is not about how, you know, juggernaut it can be. It, it doesn't have to do with your English. It has everything to do with pray in the Spirit. And finally, the Bible says, not only praying in the Spirit, but keep yourself in God's love. Amen? Keep yourself in God's love. Now, the word keeping yourself has been alluded to thrice. Let's see how it has been used in Jude. The first time that we are looking at the word keep is actually uh, in, in verse 2. Yes, in verse 1. To those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. So we are seeing here it has been used in passive. The keeping 
here is enabled of God. You know, the things that I have read, this ungodly, dreamers, blemish, waterless cloud, fruitless trees, ranging walls, wandering stars, this character of human beings or character of people are not people that we can overcome with our own thinking and our own designs and strategies. We are kept by God. And then, in the verse that we have just read, we are being told to keep yourself in God's love as you wait for, for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. You know, there is the aspect of an active aspect of us keeping ourselves, but we have to keep ourselves in something, in the love of God as we wait for eternity. Keeping ourselves in the love of God. That is, the love of God is the only thing that can carry us through. And then it has also been used, um, I think towards the end in verse 24, it says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before the glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Hallelujah. I want this God to keep me. The challenges I'm going through or you that you are going through may not be maybe doctrinal as I have read. They may be social, they may be cognitive, they may be psychological, they may be economic. What I'm saying is, and that which God is encouraging us today, this night, is we have a way out. The way out is to pray in the spirit, build ourselves in faith and to keep ourselves in the love of God. Let's stand and pray together. Can you just remember and think about that life? And do you just want to spend some time and pray to God, God, please build me up. Help me to be built in faith. Help me to pray in the Spirit. Keep me in your love. Those are the only ingredients that will carry us through, give us hope and future. Just close your eyes and pray to God. Open your mouth and speak to this God. He knows you. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your love and care. Thank you for your word. Thank you for unveiling this to us. That it is too heavy for Jude. That rather than even talking about the joy of salvation that we all share... He unveils these great things to us and to encourage us to contend, to agonize for our faith. And how do we do that, God? Help us to be built up in you. Help us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Help us to be kept in your love. We'll never get it wrong, God, when we are kept in your love. Thank you, Jesus, because your promises are yes and amen. You are able to keep us until that day. We honor you, God. We honor you, Jesus. Wajabu Wewe wajabu Wajabu Wewe wajabu 
So Lord, we pray that to each and every one of us who are, are here this evening and those who are following us online, that you will help us, O oh God, to contend for our faith, that there is nothing that will remove us from the direction of listening to you, that true word of God, contend for the right doctrine and to live for the fact that Jesus Christ lived, died, and resurrected, and to believe that he's coming again, and that that will be the basis of our faith and hope. Bless us and keep us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all, even as we contend for our faith. Shalom.